friends good evening uh, my name is ajay sood from department of physics indian institute of science and also past president of this academy professor dipankar chatterjee the current president has given me this uh, pleasant job to introduce today's speaker to you uh, as all of you know that the indian academy of sciences has a rich tradition of organizing public lectures by the best minds in different fields and today we are absolutely delighted that we have one of the most brilliant scientists professor brian schmidt for this public lecture and uh, uh, formally i would like to acknowledge the efforts of ravi subramaniam in getting us this opportunity thanks ravi uh, so on behalf of president and on my own behalf it's a great pleasure to have all of you here this evening and i apologize to some of you who have to stand and uh, out sit outside uh, to enjoy this feast but we couldn't help it so that only tells the popularity of professor brian schmidt uh, so professor brian schmidt is a laureate fellow and distinguished professor at the australian national university's mount stromlo observatory uh, professor schmidt uh, obtained his astronomy masters degree in 1992 and phd uh, later from harvard university uh, professor schmidt joined the staff of the australian national university in 1995 and was awarded the australian government's inaugural malcolm mackintosh award for the achievements in the physical sciences in 2000 uh, and there are various honors and awards which are which is a huge list and i don't want to take away the time from his talk but still for the youngsters to get inspiration i'll just mention a very few uh, the, by way of uh, introduction uh, he obtained the astronomical society of india veni bapu medal in 2000 you can see my bias in selecting the awards uh, which i am mentioning an australian research council federation fellowship in 2005 and in 2006 Uh, schmidt was awarded jointly awarded the shaw prize in astronomy and shared the 2007 gruber prize for cosmology and his high z sn search team colleagues uh, professor uh, schmidt was awarded uh, the 2011 nobel prize in physics jointly with adam rees and paul uh, and saul perlmutter he is the fellow of the national uh, australian academy of sciences the united states academy of science royal society and foreign member of the spanish royal academy of sciences in 2013 he was made a companion of the order of australia honorary citizen city of padua and usa excellence award in in, in innovation award so there are many other things which are very unique about professor schmidt and only just mention one that in addition to doing the excellent science he also has interest in uh, uh, in uh, running a vineyard and a winery in uh, uh, canberra district and uh, i think you can know more about that from his web page so it's absolutely a delight for me to request uh, professor schmidt to give his public lecture titled type 1a supernova and the accelerating universe professor schmidt Thank you very much. <laughs> All right everyone, it's great to be here and uh thank you for turning out. So, today I'm going to tell you the story of the accelerating universe and the story of the accelerating universe is really a story of cosmology. So, our discovery really came out after really 100 years of work done by the whole field. So to understand my discovery you're going to have to really understand the field of cosmology. And so I will lay this out at sort of uh a physics uh level. So um I won't be too complicated but I won't cut too many corners either. So let's start with the beginnings of cosmology. I am an observer. And so cosmology got its start in two fronts, on an observational side and on a theory side. So I'm going to start with the observational side. And it got started with this person who most of you will not know. His name was Vesto Melvin Slifer, and he worked uh in Arizona on the Lowell Observatory. And what he did is he took the light of 
galaxies and took their spectra. Now, we didn't know what a galaxy was when he did this work in 1916. And the first thing he saw is that the spectrum of a galaxy looked like the spectrum of a star. And so he surmised that these things were created were collections of stars, uh, something that uh, was sort of determined definitively 10 years later. Uh, but he noticed that on average, most of the galaxies were, had, were redshifted. They had, as he interpreted it, a Doppler shift indicating motion away from us. And so you can imagine in 1916, you discover these things, and you realize that all of these things are moving away from the Earth. So these were a bit of a mystery, because it seemed like the Earth was a special place, and all these things were moving out. We didn't really understand what they were, but it indicated a special place uh, for Earth in the universe. Part of the problem is it wasn't completely clear these things were galaxies at the time. And so that was a, a conundrum in 1916, which stayed in the realms of optical astronomy. It did not get translated particularly to the physics community. So the next thing that happened was Edwin Hubble in 1929 uh, went through and he had access to the largest telescope in the world, the Hooker 100 inch telescope, and he measured the distances to these galaxies. Now he had to do it very crudely and he did it by looking at how bright the brightest star was in a galaxy. And so if you assume that the brightest star in every galaxy is more or less the same, then just by how bright these stars are, you can measure the distance using the inverse square law, and which is exactly what he did. And what he found was that the faster the galaxy was moving away by Slipher's measurement, the fainter its stars were. In other words, he inferred that there was a further the distance, the faster the object was moving. And this was his data as he published it in 1929. Now, in 1929, from this data, of course, he concluded that the universe was expanding had this constant. But there's a story here because in 1927, Georges Lamatra, who had done his PhD by showing up at MIT and then going off to Belgium, Belgium where he was a monk, had gone through and used Hubble's data before him to make the same conclusion. Furthermore, he had also figured out Einstein's equations of general relativity, which we'll talk about in just a second, and had the idea that these, those equations suggested the universe might be expanding. The mistake he made is he showed both his data and his theory to Albert Einstein in 1927, who was visiting. And Einstein said, yeah, yeah, Friedman's already done your equations, but good job. Uh, but this idea of the expanding universe from your data, your, uh, your, your mathematics is fine, but your physics is abominable. And there ended Lamatra's uh, going out and telling the world that the universe was expanding. Hubble did not worry about Einstein. He went to the New York Times. And it turns out that's a very good way to get your, no your, your, your ideas out. So let's go to Einstein's theory of gravity. So in 1907, Einstein had that, what he described as his best thought, which was effectively that inertial mass and gravitational mass were equivalent. So a subtle thought, doesn't seem like it amount to much, it took him eight and a half years to ponder through it and to eventually in 1915 come up with his equations of general relativity, his field equations of general relativity. He submitted that paper four days after Hilbert submitted a paper which showed Einstein's field equations. Hilbert never took credit for it because he was just doing the math that Einstein was struggling with. And Hilbert was a better mathematician than Einstein. But Einstein is the one who had spent all the time working through the physics of the situation. And of course, that, um, the field equations of general relativity uh, were an idea which were looked at uh, by none other than Sir Arthur Eddington. Uh, Eddington went out and had two eclipse expeditions so that you could go through and you could see how much light was deflected as it went past the sun during an eclipse, wait for the sun to be gone, look at the eclipse area again, and see that the stars have moved. And so seeing that uh, Einstein's theory had been vindicated by his observations, he announced again 
to the press that Einstein had come up with this new theory from thought alone. Now, that made Einstein inst you know, instantaneously a hero. If, with the benefit of hindsight, we look back at Eddington's observations, which people have done, you will realize that they were not sufficient to make the claims that Eddington did. Eddington was a great theorist, not a great observer. That being said, his eclipse pictures uh, were in focus. It was just kind of cloudy. And the astronomer Royal, who was doing the other eclipse exposition, had clear weather but out of focus images. So he had to use the out of focus images to make the measurements. So Eddington's pro uh, proclamation of Einstein changing the world was actually done on false pretenses, although Eddington didn't realize it. I think he genuinely believed the data showed it. The real work was done a couple years later uh, in the Western Australian desert by two, Austra uh, by two Americans. And this is their data. And that data does stand the scrutiny of time. And of course, we know now that we've tested relativity in many, many different regimes. And it always comes out to be able to predict what we see. And that makes it a very good uh, theory, at least where we've been able to test it. Now, in 1917, Einstein was looking at how he could use his new theory of general relativity on the universe that goes on without end. And one of the first things he realized is he had a problem, is that to first order, his equations were dynamic. They changed in time, meaning that the universe would change in time. And this was 12 years before Hubble proclaimed that the world, the universe was expanding. And so Einstein, as creative as he was, could not see how he could reconcile these dynamic equations with the universe around him. And so he invented, or looked at his equations, I won't even say invented, and realized he could add a constant to them. And that constant effectively was able to balance out the pull of gravity and make a static universe. Unfortunately, it was, uh, if you perturbed the universe, then it ran away anyway. So it ended up not being a solution. And later on in life, Einstein described it as uh, effectively, uh, well, he said he acted like a donkey with the cosmological constant. But it is interesting that in 1917, he had the idea of a dynamic universe. And when confronted by Lemaitre in 1927, 10 years later, he told Lemaitre that, you know, that Lemaitre was just missing the point, despite the evidence being right there in front of him. So let's go and think about Einstein's equations. And I'm going to make them very simple, because fortunately, the universe turns out to be quite simple as we look at it. So the paradigm for understanding the universe, the global evolution of the universe, based on, is based on the theory of general relativity and an assumption. And this assumption is key to everything else I'm going to talk about. And we can talk about whether or not it's right, but I'm not going to spend too much time on that. And that assumption is that the universe is homogeneous and isotropic on large scales. And if the universe is homogeneous and isotropic on large scales, that is, every part of the universe is the same and it doesn't have a preferred direction, then it turns out you can take what is a very complex set of field equations and put them down into quite simple uh, equations, which are known as Friedman's equations. And so Friedman equations, actually two of them I'm going to show you. I'm only work with one today, is this ordinary differential equation, which has a few components, the most important which is this thing called A, the scale factor. Now, the scale factor tracks how big a piece of the universe is. You can think of it as the radius of the universe if it has cur curvature. So it is very easily measured observationally, because as photons travel through the universe, and the universe's, the space of the universe expands or contracts, light stretches or contracts with the expanding universe. And so we can track the scale factor by measuring redshift. So the thing Slipher saw was a change in scale factor. And that means that it turns out we can measure this to one part in 100,000. So we can track scale factor with amazing accuracy back in time. Now, the other thing we need to know is that because space is curved, we have to worry about the curvature of space. And in this equation, you will note there's this 
term, we have 8 pi g is just the gravitational constant, speed of light squared, t is time, rho is the density, a is the scale factor, and k is curvature. Curvature is a normalized curvature that, such that you have a closed universe, one that is uh, essentially uh, finite, where space wraps onto itself, closed geometry. You have hyperbolic geometry, where k equals minus 1. And you have what I called the just right geometry, flat geometry, where k equals 0. So with those things, let's look at a few of the astronomical constants we need, then, to make this model make sense. And one of them is what we call the Hubble parameter. This is how the expansion of the rate, it, it describes the expansion rate of the universe, and it's essentially an a, a expansion rate normalized to the size of the universe. So it's the change of the scale factor relative to the scale factor, and it has units of 1 over time, or as astronomers put it, kilometers per second, so that's the velocity, per megaparsec, the distance. So the measurement that we have for the Hubble constant right now, I'll talk a little bit about refinements to it, is a roughly uh, 71 in astronomers' units, or 1 over the Hubble constant is 14 billion years. If you think of it, if the universe is expanding that fast, and we just linearly extrapolate it back in time, it tells us that the age of the universe is about 14 billion years. That's when everything in the universe would be more or less overlapped at one spot. The other thing we need to think about is what we call the critical density. The critical density includes the Hubble constant and the gravitational constant, and it is the dividing line between a universe which is spatially closed and one that is spatially open. It is that just right universe. And when you put in the value of the Hubble constant, you find that the density, the critical density of the universe is about 9 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms per meter cubed. So a lot less than the 5,500 kilograms per meter cubed in the Earth. So the Earth is a very special place. It's 30 orders of magnitude more dense than the average part of the universe, because as we'll see, the universe is very close to the critical density. And finally, we have something that describes the density over time. We call it the density parameter, and that is the actual density of the universe divided by this critical density. So we use omega to describe that. If omega is equal to 1, then the universe has the critical density. To even make it more interesting, we tend to divide the universe, as I'll show you, into different things that it might be made out of. And so you can have omega in neutrinos, for example. What fraction of the universe is neutrinos? So you go out and solve this. This is one of the things that Friedman did. If you go through and solve what happens if you have a universe made out of you know, uh, normal matter, um, known as dust, but you can just think of it as atoms or baryons, as we call it now. And the solution is a parametric solution where effectively you, can, uh, you have a dummy para parameter called eta. So eta goes through usually 0 to 2 pi or 0 to infinity, depending on if you have the hyperbolic or the closed solution. And so I will show you what these look like graphically in a second. And then you have a quite a simple k equals 0, the flat universe, where the universe expands as t to the 2 thirds. So graphically, let's look at what that looks like. It essentially says that we're here at some point, And if you have an omega matter equals 0 universe, that's something with nothing in it then you essentially have a universe that just keeps on expanding at the same rate over time. Things move further and further apart over time, or the scale factor becomes bigger and bigger over time. You have a universe which has omega less than 1, but greater than 0. So that's a universe that has hyperbolic geometry. That is a universe that uh, expands and slowing down over time. The expansion rate slows down over time, but the universe expands forever. It continually expands, forever slowing down, but asymptotically expanding. Uh, so even at t equal infinity, it continues to expand. And then you have a universe that uh, has above the critical density in omega matter, and that universe reaches a maximum size, and the expansion turns to contraction. And of course, Instead of uh, the, all these universes begin with the Big Bang, but only that last one ends differently in what we call the Ganab Gib. That's the Big Bang backwards. All right. Now, it turns out things in the universe don't have to just be the atoms that we think of. And 
it turns out that we need to worry about how this matter behaves as the universe expands. So we describe that as the equation of state, that is how uh, pressure and density are related. And the easiest way to think about it is how the density of the material behaves as space expands. So for example, if we have normal matter, well, the density of norm normal matter goes inversely proportional as the volume. In other words, the scale factor cubed times the density of material is conserved over time. If I have a single atom in a box, the box gets bigger, the density drops as the scale factor cubed. Okay? That means it essentially is pressureless for uh, gravity. If you have something though like photons, then let's look at what happens in a photon. I have a photon in a box, the box expands, you have a single, the number density drops as the cube, but the photon gets stretched by the box. So the energy of the photon drops with the scale factor, which means that instead of going inversely with the volume, it goes as the volume to the minus four thirds. That, there's that extra power of uh, essentially a cubic root of the volume or an extra power of the scale factor. That is that the scale factor to the fourth times the energy density in photons is conserved. And then you can come up with something like the cosmological constant, which is what Einstein had to make the universe static. We can think of it as essentially as an energy term, if you want, depending on where you put it in his equations. And that stuff, the idea, is part of space itself. Its density does not change as space expands. And so the scale factor to the zeroth, or essentially independent of the scale factor, um, times the density is conserved. So why does that matter? Well, I'll show you how it, when you solve those differential equations, it does matter. Effectively, the cosmological constant has negative pressure. And so it causes the expansion of the universe to be different than something that has positive pressure or no pressure. So the other thing we need to think about is, is that the, the, the density of the universe is equal to the sum of all of its constituent parts. So when we're going to measure the critical density of the universe, or how close to the critical density of the universe we are, we have to worry about absolutely everything that's in the universe. We've got to worry about atoms. We have to worry about uh, photons. We have to worry about the cosmological constant. We have to worry about dark matter. We have to worry about neutrinos, or whatever else is in the universe. All those things sum together to give you the total density of the universe, to determine its curvature, for example. Uh, the other thing to remind ourselves that is it's probably obvious if you think about it, but a universe that is born open, that is born infinite, remains infinite for all time. You can't convert something that is infinite to being finite. In the same way that a, something that is finite is closed, remains closed for all time. Now it can asymptotically go to in infinity as t goes to infinity, but it will technically remain finite and closed for all time. And of course, the idea of if you're flat, well, if you're exactly flat, then you'll be all exactly flat for all times. But that doesn't really make sense because, you know, there is a it's a it's a it's a it's a razor's edge that one quantum fluctuation and you go to one side or the other. So the standard model revisited, I'm going to make it even more simple. I'm going to make the universe flat and then I can rewrite this equation. And when I rewrite this equation, I use the Hubble constant right now. That's the expansion rate of the universe right now. And I'm going to describe everything as the value, everything relative to the values they have right now. So for example, the scale factor right now is A naught, the density right now, rho naught, the Hubble constant right now, H naught, and here I'm having K equals zero. And this allows us to get a sense of how what is in the universe affects how the universe expands. So I take that at differential equation. So you know all general relativity boils down to this single equation. If you have the universe be flat and homogeneous and isotropic, and so this equation can easily be solved if I make a substitution for how density changes over time. Remember, I, the universe is made out of atoms. Then rho over rho naught, a over a naught cubed is equal to one. So I can substitute that in this equation rewrite my differential equation, and this is a differential equation that even an astronomer can solve because you just integrate both sides. You integrate and you get that classic t to the two-thirds 
solution. If the universe is made only of atoms or something that behaves like atoms. What happens if the universe is full of photons? Then my substitution is different. Instead of the third power, it's the fourth power. That means when I substitute in, I get a slightly different equation I need to integrate. You integrate, you get t to the half. So you have expansion that is, uh, sorry, the, the scale factor is going as t to the half. That means the universe is slowing down more quickly. The derivative is higher than t to the two thirds. So a universe full of atoms slows down a bit. A universe full of photons slows down much more quickly. And then we have a universe that, for example, has a cosmological constant. Here, we're going to have a different substitution, a to the zero. So when I put that in here, I get this differential equation. And when I integrate that, instead of getting a power law, I get an exponential. And so here we get, instead of the universe slowing down, we get exponential expansion. We get acceleration. So what is in the universe changes its behavior over time. And to make things, I think, a little more complicated, you can imagine if the universe is made up of all of these things, then things will change over time. Because if you think about the density in a piece of space, let's say it's made out of atoms and photons. Well, the density of the photons, the energy density of the photons is going up as the fourth power of the scale factor. The density in atoms is going as the third factor. So if the universe has photons and atoms in it right now, and the atoms dominate, sometime in the past, if I go back so the scale factor is smaller and smaller, I will be able to choose a time when the universe becomes dominated by photons. In the same way, imagine the universe has a cosmological constant in it. If the universe expands, then the ratio of the cosmological constant, which has got a constant density, is not going to change, but the density of, uh, for example, atoms is going to drop as the cube of the scale factor. If the universe expands long enough and does an asymptote to a value such that the density uh, stays above the cosmological constant, if the universe is born with a cosmological constant, then at some point it's likely the cosmological constant will take over because it will have a higher density. Now we think the universe has photons, it has atoms and dark matter which behave just like photon or uh, just like uh, the baryons that we know here on Earth. And so we can expect a universe that really has these three phases of radiation dominating early on, matter dominating for a while, and now it seems we're in an era where the cosmological constant is dominating. Now the other thing we need to know, I've talked about scale factors and I've talked about time. Well, as an astronomer, I have a problem. I cannot go out and easily measure time. I can measure it here on Earth, but when I look at a distant galaxy, I have no way of saying that's t of you know 12.3749 billion years after the Big Bang or 1.357 billion years before right now. So it's not a very convenient observable. We need to convert to something else which is distance and to do that we need to use the uh, one other thing that we get out of the homo homogeneous universe independent of general relativity. This is just geometry. It's known as the Robertson Walker line element and it's how we connect distance, that is the separation of two points based on their chain, the time difference between the two compared to, we'll say, the time after the Big Bang, their coordinates in the universe, the curvature of the universe, and the dynamics of the universe. And so this equation does all the accounting of figuring out how to go from point A to point B in the universe when it's expanding in time, has curvature, and we need to worry about time differences as well as coordinate differences. And so when you want to go from point A to point B, it really does matter about all these different things simultaneously. And this tells you, for example, how light or any object will travel through the universe, how information travels through the universe. So if you put this together with the dynamic equations I showed you from the Friedman equation, directly from general relativity, you can go out, for example, and figure out how bright an object is. Why do I choose that? Well, Hubble did it, and we do it because that's what astronomers are good at doing. We're good at it looking at how big things are and how bright they are. That's sort of what astronomers do. 
And one of the reasons why physicists make fun of us all the time is because that's all that astronomers do. We don't get to make our experiments. We have to go out, look through the universe, and try to piece together an experiment from what nature provides. It's a big handicap, but it's kind of fun as well. It's sort of like if every problem has a Sudoku uh, puzzle to begin with. So if you go through and put, take this all together, you can go through and calculate how bright an object appears uh, as a function of its redshift or its scale factor. Remember, the redshift and scale factors are just reciprocals of each other. So the luminosity distance, so that is effectively described as the inverse square law, is consistent, it turns out, depends on exclusively of what is in the universe, how much, and its equation of state. So this is the equation that an astronomer can go out and try to look at figuring out, for example, omega, so that's how much stuff there is in every type of matter relative to the critical density. So I need to have omega and the equation of state for everything. So for example, normal matter, this is omega matter, so the fraction in atoms and dark matter compared to a critical density the equation of state, W equals zero for us. We can do photons, same number. That then is a, is a third, so that exponent becomes the fourth, and so forth and so on. We also have to worry about the curvature in the universe, but the curvature of the universe is just the sum of all the omegas minus one. So once again, the brightness of an object depends exclusively on what is in the universe, how much, and its equation of state. Uh, okay, well... We'll see. I'm just going to... Hope that we get all three guns back. Um, <clears throat> so, the other thing we need to worry about out in front is the Hubble constant. But that's just an overall normalization factor. It tells you the distance. This is going to make the lines curved, and it's that curvature we're going to measure to extract what's in the universe based on this set of parameters. So let's graphically look at these parameters. Here we measure distance, and I'm sorry I'm using astronomers' units here, but it's effectively logarithmic distance. Here's redshift, so that's equivalent to scale factor. And so I can just plot it up here, but that's essentially a diagram that has lots of white space in it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract off an empty universe, a universe with nothing in it whatsoever. We'll call that our null hy hypothesis, if you want to think of it that way. And what you can see is that if the universe has only normal matter in it, then um, the more matter there is, the faster the universe slows down over time. Uh-oh. Let's try this one. Oh well, it's still okay. You won't like all the color photos that come up there. So, if the universe is only full of you know, stuff that has uh, normal matter, you can essentially weigh the universe by the trajectories of how bright objects appear as a function of redshift. The heavier the object, the heavier the universe, the more density the universe has in normal matter, then the, uh, essentially the brighter the objects appear as a function of redshift compared to our null hypothesis. It's only if the universe is accelerating with something like a cosmological constant, that objects can appear fainter than this null hypothesis. Okay. I also show here that it turns out that the size of an object also can be used um, to go through and do a similar type of uh, measurement. So from this basic theory done in the 1920s and early 30s, we really stayed without much change 
until the 1970s and 80s. In the 1970s and 80s, we had to tweak the model just a little bit, and that was to add what we call inflation. Now, inflation's a bit of a cartoon, but the basic idea is that the universe expanded at, a, uh, at an exponential rate very early on, right after the Big Bang, and that was able to do a couple things. It was able to make the parts of the universe we see in the two different directions of the sky to have been in contact when the universe was very young, thereby hopefully explaining why they could be the same temperature. It also was able to take quantum fluctuations and grow them to the size of the universe on all different scales, and those provide the seeds that make the galaxies that we see today. If you don't have those ripples in the early universe, it turns out we wouldn't have galaxies today. The gravity would not have been able to make what we are all living in. The other thing they had to add was the idea of dark matter, cold dark matter to be specific. This was first thought of because when we looked at galaxies and how fast they were rotating, there was always a lot more mass indicated by the rotation than by the stars and dust and gas that we saw. Always about a factor of six or seven. It turns out that if you want to evolve structure and get the galaxies to look like we do, you can't do it with atoms alone. Again, you need something that seems to not to want to interact with itself. You need to have 85% of the universe not interact with itself to make the structures of galaxies that we see to work. So it seems like a little bit of these two seem a little hokey, but of course we can go out and test them. So these things predict that the universe, it turns out, inflation uh, drives the universe to being flat geometrically. So it predicts the universe should be flat. And it turns out it predicts how structures should have, how much densities and galaxies we should have on different scales. So in 1990, people were out testing this. And they were looking at how many galaxies there were across the sky on different scales. And so this was uh, an experiment done by just looking and counting galaxies and essentially measuring how likely it was for two galaxies on the sky uh, to be next to each other relative to a random distribution. So galaxies on the sky, if you see one galaxy, you're much more likely to see a galaxy next to it compared to one far away because galaxies cluster. And this is the uh, prediction of the cold dark matter theory, and it didn't get the right answer. And the question was, why not? They suggested at the time, this is George Staffew et al., that uh, it didn't work for a mega matter, that is uh, the normal stuff, dark matter and, uh, and atoms, adding up to one, did not work. They could fix it if they added a cosmological constant. Now, it turns out they could also more or less fix it if they just didn't have that at all as well. But they didn't necessarily believe their answer. So here was the next paper that George was part of. And rather than talking about how this meant that the universe was full of a cosmological constant, instead they were worried about saying whether or not their, their cold dark matter theory worked at all. And so this was defending why we should not throw out the theory because it seems to have failed. Now it turns out their first solution was the correct one. The reason their data failed to match this curve is because there is a cosmological constant. And they had the right idea. But unfortunately, they did not have enough ammunition with people believing the cold dark matter, enough proof for people to believe it. And even they themselves abandoned this idea. Other people went through and said, well, if we have a Hubble constant, which is really, really small, so the universe is really, really old, we can fix it that way. And this was a paper that was put out in 1994. Now I had a problem for that because for my PhD thesis, shown here, at the end of three years, 11 months, and four days, but I wasn't counting. I am showing my PhD supervisor, Bob Kirshner, my measurement for the expansion rate of the universe. And I was getting a number around 70, not 30. And 30 was like seven standard deviations away from my measurement. Pretty hard to accept that the universe could be that crazy. So in 1994, we had sort of an interesting situation. 
where it was widely presumed that the universe was made up of normal matter, that is, pressureless matter. Uh, that one didn't turn out right. The theorist really held on, as I would almost say, as religion, that the inflation cold dark matter paradigm was correct. That meant omega was one, that is, the total amount of stuff had to be one. That implied just to make the universe old enough that it had to have a Hubble constant of less than 50, and that the observers were simply wrong when they went out and measured things like the Hubble constant and omega matter. I was from the observers camp, and we, the observers, had gone out and measured omega matter in a variety of ways. We always got a number like 0.2. We always measured the Hubble constant, and although it was controversial, we inevitably got numbers greater than 50, 50 to 80 and even 100. But we did not get numbers like 30 or 40. And so for us, it was easy. Inflation and CDM was just wrong. As an observer, you see that whenever you tell, you show a theorist is wrong, some other theorist comes up with an equally plausible idea the next week and puts it on the archive now. So we're just waiting for them to come up with another explanation. But the other explanation never really eventuated. So rather than just be stuck in this, as I moved to Australia, I decided that we had the ability through technology and ideas to actually go through and see how things change back in time. And we could do that by looking at things that were very bright with the modern technology. And the things that were really bright were type 1a supernovae, and I'll talk about those in a second. Well, they're explosions of stars. They were first looked at by Fritz Zwicky who in the 1930s discovered these explosions of stars, and using his data the year after I was born, by planning how bright they were versus their redshift, you could even see that there was an expansion law. But the difference was this was done with an 18-inch telescope, and it went out a thousand times further than Hubble could do with a 100-inch telescope, because the objects are five billion times brighter than our sun, so they're very bright. And so, uh, based on this, there was a, these supernovae always had a huge reputation as being something we could use in the future. Indeed, there was even a supernova search started in 1986 by a Danish team that discovered a fairly distant supernova in 1988. These things are quite easy to identify. They take 20 days to reach maximum brightness. They fade away. They're dominated by sulfur and silica in their spectrum. And so, there are objects we can see relatively rarely in the nearby universe. The Milky Way, the last one in the Milky Way, was in 1604, observed by Kepler and Galileo. So, you, you do, I'm not waiting for one right now, although I am. I look out the sky every night to see if I see it. So, that data that was used was not very good data. And a group in Chile in 1990 went out and decided to do, really figure out how good these things are. And what they did is they found them the same way that Zwicky did, because in 1990, digital detectors were still not big. So they had to use photographic plates. So they used the Schmidt telescope, just like Zwicky did. They went out and took one photographic plate. They took another one. Then they used this machine. They put one plate here, one plate here, and they have a little lever here. And you go flip, 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 and your eye gets one and the other. And your eye is very good at picking out the things that have changed. The reason they did that is computers were slow in 1990 as well. We were using Pentium 100s, for those who remember those. And your brain was much, much faster than any computer software you could do to sift through that data. So they sifted through it that way, but then they followed it up with modern, when they discovered an object, they used modern digital detectors to measure exactly how bright they were. The old work had been done with photographic plates, and it was not accurate. Photographic plates do not tell you how bright an object is very accurate. And when I visited these guys in 1990, they were depressed because they had found their first few objects and they were expecting them all to be intrinsically the same brightness. And they showed me this one of their first objects and this object was substantially fainter at the same distance of other objects they had seen. And it also rose and fell more quickly. And they thought their, their project was a mess. It was the end. These things aren't any good. We're not going to have to figure out something, something else to do. But they persisted, and then they had the revelation that that pattern continued. That supernovae which are faint rise and fall more quickly than those which are bright. 
And we can attribute to this because these objects synthesize more nickel-56 in their explosion, which eventually radioactively decays through cobalt to iron. These are the objects that make two-thirds of the iron in the universe. These things, that iron has opacity, and so the heat diffusion is more slow. It also has lots of radioactivity, has lots of energy, and so you can understand physically why this would occur. Why these objects, there are some objects that have less iron than others, we don't really know. We do understand why there would be a pattern. And so in 1994, Mario Hamui from the group came up and visited us in Harvard just before I moved to Australia, and he showed me what he had been working on, and I looked at his points and how they lie in the redshift distance line, and I said, boy, those all lie right on the line. That is because these things were much better distance indicators than anything that anyone else had ever used before. Rather than having scatter of 15 or 20 percent, they had a scatter of 6 percent in distance. And 6 percent in distance compared to 20 percent means you're more than three times more accurate. That means you need 10 times less objects. And these things are brighter than almost anything. So you can see them all the way across the universe. So this team in Chile eventually provided 29 supernovae. They provide the fundamental basis of using supernovae as accurate distance indicators. They turned out to be used, as I'll show you, by both teams to help measure the acceleration. So our team was born when not that thing happened in 1994. And Saul Perlmutter called us up and said, after six years of looking for supernovae, he had suddenly found a bunch of them using the new big digital detectors. We finally got these four megapixel detectors, 2,000 by 2,000 pixel CCDs. Those were delivered in 1994. And that enabled him and his team to suddenly fight, st start finding supernovae in large quantities. Now, we did talk about working with Saul. He came from a particle physics background. We were astronomers. We knew all about the supernovae. He knew all about how to discover them. It made sense to get together, but we disagreed on how to do things. So we tried, we failed, and so we formed two teams. In our case, our team was born when I was down in Chile, uh, and I was with Nick Sunsef, and we decided that we would go and do our own experiment and be comfortable the way we we're going to do it. We'd be happy with it. And so a few months later, our proposal went in, and it turned out finding these supernovae that Saul had learned how to do over six years I had to learn out how to do over a few months. And it was not easy because my first son had just been born. I was moving to Australia. And uh, the trick is you take an image like this and you have to find, and we have a thousand of these, so 50 gigabytes of data. And there's thousands of galaxies in each of these images and you have to find the exploding star. So I had to write the software on these time when we had 50 gigabytes of data and one gigabyte hard drives. We had Pentium 100s, and it was hard. And so Saul's team was, was better at it than we were. So one of the objects, for example, is right here. It's this guy. And the way we do this is we take two images, and we digitally subtract one from the other. And that's, was, it's easier to do now, because you have an iPhone app to do it. But we had to write the iPhone app in the old days. <laughs> and uh, so nothing here in a period of three weeks became something. This was an object that was five billion light years in distance, it exploded before the Earth was formed. So you can literally go back and look back in time with these things. So to give you a sense, I'm going to take you to Chile, to one of our uh, runs on the CTIO 4 meter, and here as the sky sits down you see silhouetted Greg Aldering. He's from the other team. Because we were both using the same equipment, because it was the best equipment in the world, we always ended up on the telescopes with each other. So it was intense competition, but we certainly saw each other. And as the sky goes by, Nick Sunsef here is making sure that every photon counts. We're pointed exactly where we need to do. Data is good quality, because we get six nights a year. We get six nights a year. And as my software is finding things, it finds a lot of things that you don't necessarily want, junk. So we have a sweatshop of people in digging through the data trying to determine the things that my software find, whether or not they're right or wrong. Time is of the essence because 36 hours later, on the other side of the planet, we're going to use the other piece of technology that had emerged, 
the new 10 meter telescopes in the form of the Keck Observatory. And so here we have Adam Rees and Alex Filipenko there taking spectra of our discoveries, but we had to turn these around very quickly. And there is Saul Perlmutter using the telescope as well because of course he needs that same piece of equipment just like we do. So it was interesting to see what happened initially. Here was our first discovery in 1995. I made the, the, the mistake of trying to, for whatever reason, thinking that the 100,000 lines of code that I had written to do this software would work the first time on the other side of the planet. So I stayed in Australia and the internet connectivity between Australia and Chile in 1995 was one character per second. A, B, C. I thought we were going to die because nothing worked, but out of the chaos suddenly emerged this object. So these things would work, these would be sent to me by email, nothing even I would get these tiny little postage stamps which would be emailed to me. Email is the only way you could actually reliably get things because uh, FTP, which we all know, would drop out all the time and you, you just never get anything through. So what happens here is you have the image that we took, for this case in February, the image we took in March, then I had to make this image look like this image, and you subtract it and you're left over with something. That object was a supernova, it was our first supernova. Uh, supernova 1995K, and it was the most distant the supernova yet discovered at that time. So that was a very lucky last minute thing. We really discovered that on the last possible moment that we could. So when we put that onto our first Hubble diagram, it was down in this funny part of the diagram where uh, indicating that the universe was speeding up, that there was acceleration. But it was one object, I didn't worry about it. One of our time allocation committees did worry about it. They said, you guys know what you're doing because the universe seems to be speeding up and the other team clearly shows the universe is slowing down. So they gave Saul's team the time, told us we were wrong, you know, we didn't know what we were doing. I pointed out that the error bar in this was nothing to worry, you know, at this point you can't make any conclusions. Anyway, if you're going to go out and measure things, you need to worry about a bunch of things. You need to worry about dust. The universe is full of dust. Dust makes things fainter. It also tends to make things redder. So we can use the reddening to calculate how much dust there is, but it does rely that the dust properties at high redshift and low redshift are the same. We have to worry about the supernovae themselves changing over time. We have to worry about selecting the bright objects because there's a larger volume that we can select them. And we have to worry about things which we call k corrections because astronomers are out looking at these supernovae and they're at different redshifts, so their light has been stretched into different band passes. So in the nearby universe we'll have a piece of blue glass that will have a transmission and the integral of this times that is how many photons we detect. When we look at a supernova at a redshift of a half, well, you wouldn't see anything if you looked at it in blue light, so we look at it in red light and there's a little bit of difference between that band pass and that band pass. We have to calculate those things. And so just to show you the types of corrections we make, to show you we do these things, you go out and you do that for a bunch of nearby objects, and you can make a correction that's good to about a percent. So after doing this for three years, three very long, hard years, Adam Reese calls me up one day and says, I'm going to send you something, and you've got to tell me what you think about it. So he sends me essentially the work that this, uh, his lab book is based on. And it shows that that first supernovae is not alone, that on average the supernovae are in the part of the diagram where the universe appears to be accelerating. I'm feeling uh, sick. I did not say Eureka. I, I think, God, what have we done wrong? So thereby, Adam and I spend several months working together to piece through every part of the experiment independently comparing our results, and then reconciling the differences we find. Uh, at the beginning of 1998, we go through and tell the team that this has happened. And our team, it's interesting from a team perspective to see the reactions of people. And so the team is excited and worried and all spread over four continents. And here are the emails. Alex Filipenko gets the message that the universe in our data appears to be accelerating and we can't make it go away. 
So Alex is very, very enthusiastic. Adam showed me fantastic plots before he left for his wedding. Adam had chosen this weekend to get married. Not a good idea. Our data imply a non-zero cosmological constant. Who knows, this might be the right answer. Bruno Leibengut, a very reserved Swiss working at ESO. Concerning a cosmological constant, I'd like to ask Adam or anyone else in the group, they feel prepared enough to defend the answer. There's no point in writing an article if we're not sure we're getting the right answer. Me in Australia, who's been working on this for a long time, I agree our data imply a cosmological constant, but how confident are we in this result? I find it perplexing. I found it downright perplexing that the universe would be doing this. Bob Kirshner, who was Adam Reese's and my PhD supervisor in Harvard, I am worried. In your heart, you know the cosmological constant is wrong, so your head tells you that you, might, you don't care and you're just reporting the observation. It would be silly to say we must have a non-zero cosmological constant only to retract it next year. Mark Phillips in Chile, one of the group that helped figure out how to make type 1a supernovae work, as serious and responsible scientists, ha, we all know that it is far too early to be reaching firm conclusions about the value of the cosmological constant. Now truth be said, Adam and I are the only ones who have really gone through the data at this point. John Tonry in Hawaii, who remembers the detection of the magnetic monopole or other gaps? On the other hand, we should not be shy about getting our results out. Alex Filipenko chimes back in, if we're wrong in the end, then so be it. At least we ran in the race. He's worried because just up the hill from him is Saul Perlmutter. And we have no idea what Saul Perlmutter is doing, but we know that we're behind and we have this amazing result. Adam Reese comes back from his wedding, about to head out to his honeymoon. The results are very surprising, shocking even. I've avoided telling anyone about this because I wanted to do cross-checks and I wanted to get further into writing the results up. The data require a non-zero cosmological constant. Approach these results not with your heart or your head, but with your eyes. We're observers, after all. <laughs> Alejandro Clochiati, I think, gets the best quote. He's in Chile. If Einstein made a mistake with the cosmological constant, why couldn't we? <laughs> and then Nick Sunseft, who, as you recall, is sort of our mentor and helped form the team. I really encourage you to work your butt off on this. We need to be careful, but if you really are sure that the cosmological constant is non-zero, my God, get it out. I mean this seriously. You will probably will never have another scientific result that is more exciting come your way in your lifetime. So that gives you a sense of what the team thinks on day one. So we plot the data out here, and as you're all aware, Saul Perlmutter's team at the same time was getting the same crazy answer, and we did not know about each other's results. So we independently arrived at the results. And if you plot the data, ours is in black, theirs in white. I should say all these data are from the, the Kalan Tololo group. And they have more objects than us, but we have more signal to noise per object. And so when you put them in terms of calculating the probability of a cosmological constant in normal matter, you will see that the two experiments get pretty much exactly the same answer with about the same amount of precision. If you ask yourself, what what, how sure are you that omega lambda is not zero? You are, each experiment is about 99.9% .9 sure that the universe is not down here. If you put them together, you're 99.99% .99 sure. So we're not at the five standard deviations of a Higgs boson, we're at four standard deviations. So, uh, obviously a lot of work has come between us and then, but this is the papers and the team that did that work. Here we are together for the first and only time the entire high reg super team, supernova team was together. And here we are in Stockholm. Uh, we worked together, we all knew each other, but we were never together as a team. And that is the beauty of the internet. You can actually do things across the world. And of course we weren't the only ones there. Uh, Saul Perlmutter's team was there as well, and we had a good time celebrating things. But there are many questions about this result. Why now? If we look back in time, we know that the cosmological constant and matter are about the same right now, but since they scale as the one plus redshift cubed, back in the past, the cosmological constant would have been zero. If the Earth was born two billion years after the Big Bang, we would have never been able to measure the cosmological constant. In the same way, in the future, 
the cosmological constant will dominate everything. And we wouldn't be able to, well, we might be able to miss it because there might not be anything to measure, as I'll talk about. So other experiments have come along. One of the first ones was the cosmic microwave background. These are sound waves that have been propagating since the time of the Big Bang at uh, the speed of light times 0.577. That's the speed of uh, sound in this plasma. And so we have a ruler here because there is a characteristic scale of the time, the age of the universe times the speed of sound of how long those sound waves have been able to propagate. And we can go through and we can use those rulers as a way of measuring, it turns out, the geometry of the universe. Because not only is it the redshift that matters of how big something will be, it's the curvature of space. And so, for example, from Earth, if you look at a ruler, this ruler appears the same size despite being two different sizes. And analogous, it's like looking in a mir rear view mirror. Objects appear larger in curved finite space because space bends light paths. So if you go through and you look at the cosmic microwave background six months after our experiment, this is what it looked like. A true believer would say, this blue curve is preferred over the red curve. This is omega matter equal 0.2, that's omega matter equal 1, a flat universe. So this is a flat universe, this is an open universe. But it was really in uh, 2000, with two experiments, Boomerang and Maxima, where we could really see that the theory was predicting something. So interestingly enough, this is this lab, this dotted, that is the measurement predicted from supernovae. This is the best fit model through the data. And you'd say it's not perfect. Well, it turns out it was the data that wasn't perfect. As data got better, it ended up being exactly on the dotted line predicted from the supernovae. And so that told us, this dotted line, the, the, the model here already told us that the universe was effectively flat in geometry. And so by 2000, we had a new constraint. We had a constraint that the universe was flat and the supernova measurements, instead of being four standard deviations, became more than seven standard deviations. This was, when, I, when this data came out, I woke up and saw it and I remember thinking, wow, we're right. I didn't necessarily believe we were gonna be right until I saw this. When I saw this, I didn't see any easy way for us to be wrong. Additional work came in the area of large-scale structure. Here's a map done in Australia uh, using the Anglo-Australian uh, telescope. And so that allows us, it turns out, that structure allows you, for example, to measure omega matter very accurately. And you could put all this together. And the more we put things together, the more things solidified into a single part of the diagram. Such that by 2003, we had more supernovae. We had the measurement of omega matter from large-scale structure, and we had the first cosmic microwave background measurements with WMAP. And together, there was one single solution, a solution with omega lambda of about 70, 0.7, omega matter of about 0.3. And that measurement has still persisted to this day. So what is the dark energy? Well, one possibility is Einstein's, that the universe has a cosmological constant in it. Uh, it has the uh, attribute that it predicts very well what the universe should be doing over time. There are no free parameters except for omega lambda and omega matter. And so we can test this uh, with a great deal of precision. But there are other ideas. For example, there are ideas of essentially a dynamic fluid related, which is often called, for example, quintessence. Uh, you can go to Japan and find that quintessence was not discovered by Paul Steinhardt, but rather by a Japanese cosmetologist. And there are other possibilities, such as that general relativity itself is wrong in some way. We test general relativity in the strong field, but in the weak field, it is not terribly well tested. The problem we have with dark energy is there are so many ideas. This is three months worth. And none of these ideas really distinguish them from each other as which is right or wrong. So we need to be able to test things. And we do test things. This is where the super data, supernova data look like now. There are 700 objects there. The best fitting cosmological constant model is there. You can see it fits the data brilliantly. 
we are in such good shape here that we can get rid of general relativity and we can simply use the Robertson-Walker metric to measure whether or not the universe is expanding or contracting, or is accelerating or not. This blue line, if you're below the blue line, you're accelerating. And what you see is that the universe was accelerating to a redshift of about 0.6. We say that only assuming that the universe is homogeneous and isotropic, independent of general relativity. So is there any way out of acceleration? I think the answer is not easily unless the universe is not homogeneous and isotropic. And I'm not going to talk too much about that, but that's one of those things we can test. Of course, the cosmic microwave background, these bumps and wiggles, are one part in 100,000. So it seems pretty homogeneous in that respect. And we can take better and better data. This is from the last bit of WMAP. And that model, the cosmological constant model, fits that extraordinarily well. We can even use this peak of sound waves. This is where structure was back 380,000 years after the Big Bang. And we can see that imprinted in the galaxies of today. That scale is seen here in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey as an excess in probability of galaxies. So the galaxies of today have that sound wave imprinted from all those years back. And that's a way of measuring distance completely independent of supernovae. And when they do it, the gray area are the supernova measurements, and that is the size of that sound wave back in time. We get the same answer within the uncertainties. You put it all together, and what do you get? Not only do you get that there's a cosmological constant, we can measure the equation of state of the stuff that's expanding, the accelerating the universe, and it turns out to be consistent with a cosmological constant. Now, a few months ago, the WMAP experiment was replaced with a much finer experiment, a uh, much more higher resolution experiment, Planck. And so the Planck measurement has been kind of interesting because it's provided sort of an order of magnitude improvement on our cosmological parameters. And most of them look pretty good. The two that don't are the value of omega matter, this is the old value, and the Hubble constant. And they are sort of, there is some tension there between the old and the new values. There is particularly some tension between the supernovae best fit and the Planck best fit. So this was from the Planck paper, and it turns out there's about three standard or four standard deviations difference. Now, it turns out that this measurement was made without all the systematic error contributions included, and there is also, it turns out, a small error in the supernova data that has, was actually found before the Planck measurements, uh, which brings things not perfectly into agreement, but into better agreement. So Planck gets, for example, that the Hubble constant should be 67.8. Local measures turn out to be more like 74. That is about two and a half standard deviations of tension. But we should remind ourselves they're very different measures of the Hubble constant. One is a six parameter fit, and the other is a direct measure of what the universe is doing in the local universe. But when you look at how the local measurement is made, it is not trivial. And the calibration of how far things are away is everything. And so Adam Rees of the High Register Supernova team has been leading this. And he used a maser distance, which has changed again before the Planck results were measured from 7.3 to 7.6 megaparsecs. So that's a few percent difference. And that has affected his, the Hubble constant you would get out a little bit, by about 1%. There are still two standard deviations of uh, tension. I don't think we should worry about two standard deviations of tension, but I do think we should go out and improve these measurements as best as we can. So what's my take? A flat lambda cold dark matter model fits any given set of data, but there are some small inconsistencies with data sets. But I think there are things we should go out and look. I don't see anything that changes that view. We can continue to improve our optical data sets on supernovae, but all analysis from here on out needs to be done as a blind analysis. We can no longer go out and do something without doing it blind, where we don't know the answer, even looking at the data, until we add some offset. So we can't be fooled in to confirmation bias. 
But however you look at it, the future of the universe seems to be this dark energy. And the big question is, does it have an equation of state of minus one or something else? And this is considered a huge question around the world. And it really asks the question, I guess, or the future of the universe, if this continues, then we have a very interesting end in store for the universe. Dark energy is accelerating the universe, and the more it accelerates, the more it dominates. And so eventually we're going to get into that exponential expansion, analogous to the universe at the time of inflation, where the creation of space happens more quickly than light can travel through it. This is a diagram that sort of shows it, where we plot time, the blue line is right now, and co-moving distance. So that's the distance that has redshift taken out. It tells you objects you can, you know, that it, it sort of tells you uh, how much space contains a given amount of matter. And so there is something known as the Hubble sphere that tells you the maximum radius where information is going to eventually reach us. And you see that that reached a maximum back here about six billion years ago when the universe started accelerating. For now and into ever into the future, that Hubble sphere is moving in. That is, light from objects that we used to be able to see will no longer be able to reach us. We are going to be frozen out as the universe exponentially expands from everything. Eventually, we'll live in an empty universe except for a super galaxy. But the reality is, we can say that, but we don't understand what's accelerating the cosmos. So really, until we do understand, anything is possible. Dark energy could change. It could not even be dark energy. It could be something else. So we really don't know what is going to happen. But I think if we're going to try to figure this problem out, it's not going to be easy. I expect that rather than these huge projects that are out trying to measure the equation of state, it is quite likely that by chasing some of the mysteries that are in physics besides dark energy, we might well, by exploring our universe, gain insight into dark energy from an unexpected source. So that is my best bet how we're going to understand dark energy. But for now, if the acceleration continues, the universe will, at an ever-increasing rate, expand and fade away, meaning that all the galaxies and all the universe that I study will become inaccessible, and I guess that means I'll have to become a condensed matter physicist in the future. Thank you very much. You can have a few questions if you have time. I realize it went a little long. Uh, no problem. Uh, okay, Professor uh, Schmidt has agreed to take few questions. I realize there will be many, many more, but uh, in the interest of time, we may have to limit that. So We have coffee afterwards too, right? Uh, yes, we can catch him at coffee. Uh, okay, so anyone? We are also spellbound. No questions after all. <laughs> Ben? Yeah. yeah. This thing came into news. Uh, they said there's a seven magnitude star in the constellation Libra, and it's uh, about two billion years older than the universe. How do you explain that? Uh, I don't, because how one of the things I told you is very hard to measure ages in the universe, and measuring the age of a star is a very a single star is very challenging. So I have looked a bit at how they measure the age of that star, and my sense is that we need to look at that very carefully. I would like to see it repeated by different groups, and uh, my sense is that it will not stand up to scrutiny. But that's my sense. I also very strongly believe that you go out and you chase these things down, and you try to understand what's going on. But that's my guess. And if you were right, if it were to hold up for long-term scrutiny, then we would clearly have a revolution on our hands. Thank you, sir. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Microphone coming. Yep. Uh, what is our best estimate of the equations of state of the cosmological constant? 
And where is it from? So the, if we put all of the experiments we have together, it turns out to be very hard, and there's lots of degeneracies. I can trade off how much matter there is with the Hubble constant and the equation of state cosmic microwave background. If we put everything together, then our best guess is that the equation of state, 68% confidence, is between minus 1.1 and minus 0.9. So about, you know, it's centered more or less on the best value, uh, the, co the cosmological constant value, but with that level of uncertainty. We can probably improve that level of uncertainty by a factor of three or four by spending a billion dollars, which is what the Euclid experiment more or less amounts to. No, uh, and no one will hear you. Hear, hear you. Yeah, I yeah. will, just behind you. It's not working. Others cannot hear. Please comment, or really comment more possibly on the origins of dark energy and the possible later manifestations of dark energy. No. Uh, well, the answer is no. We really there's ten thousand ideas, and so. Uh, I'm sure there's even several ideas in this audience. So the answer is I'm not prepared to, to tell you where it comes from. I mean, there are just so many places it might come from. And the key is coming up with something we can test. And at this point, it's been very difficult because everything that's been testable thus far has been ruled out. OK, so let me take the last question. Yeah. Quasars. Yeah, quasars. Yep. Yeah, they're said to be at the edge of the universe. They are accelerating or are moving at a very faster rate. The red shifts are more. But as the universe is expanding and accelerating at the faster rate, uh, we will lose these subjects after some time. Or yep. we will be left without any evidence. In the yeah, in the long term, what will happen is if you think what happens, let's, see, let's say I had a clock on a quasar. And so the most distant quasar we have right now is at a redshift of 7. It's at, so that's, it turns out to be about 500 million years after the Big Bang. So it would have a clock that said 500 million years after the Big Bang. Now imagine what happens when I come back a billion years from now and I measure it. I look at it and it's clock. It turns out instead of being at a redshift of 7, now it's at a redshift of 8. And the clock has only gone forth, not a billion years, but a hundred million years. And as the universe speeds up, its clock goes slower and slower as it gets larger and larger redshift. And at some point, it becomes impossibly faint to see, and its clock stops. So it just sort of gets frozen out. So in the long term, that happens to every single thing that we can see in the universe beyond our own uh, galaxy and nearby galaxies which are gravitationally bound. And so in the long term, 100 billion years from now, the nearest galaxies will be at a redshift of 10. So wait 200 billion years. Then they're at a redshift of 50. You can't see them at all. And you look out and you just see a universe that has nothing in it. And so if you're an astronomer at that point, you wouldn't bother building a big telescope because there would be nothing to look at. Good. Okay. Thank you. Friends, you will all agree that this has been a very fabulous evening. And I'm sure you would have many more questions. But in the interest of time, uh, I'll close the session here. And to express our uh, gratitude and appreciation, I'll request uh, Professor Deepankar Chatterjee, President of Indian Academy of Sciences, to give a bouquet and a small memento. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. These two books are by Professor C. B. Raman, the founder of the Academy. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you once again, Professor Schmidt. It has been really fabulous. And I'll request all of you to join us for a cup of tea, where if you get a chance, you can still catch him. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah.